I should say this now before I forget. We are not going to have a meeting next week, so everybody knows that. <laughs> okay, we'll meet the, the week following that. Okay, I would like uh, us to be reminded today that this world is moving according to a certain plan. God has revealed the issues to us in the book of Revelation. So we don't need to be caught uh, wondering what's happening. We're going to review the last few years to see if we can pick out the game plan of the enemy. Because that's what's going to become obvious very quickly here. We, uh, all of us read newspapers or hear the news one way or another, and we have our own view of things. We're putting together some things in our mind, I'm sure. But we want to look at three very specific things today that we can look at and know that history is being fulfilled just the way the Bible said is going to happen. Okay. Now, this is important for several reasons. The most important one to me is that we need to know we are following truth and not just fables that came out of some place. You know, we as humans are just as subject to being fooled as anybody else. <laughs> we have to remember that. We are open to deception. And we want to be very careful that we are following Bible truth and not be playing games. All right, so we want to focus now on three events that may help us to understand what's going on. The first one was on November 10th, 1994. November 10th, 1994. This declaration was made to the world through the papacy. It was called... Tertio Millennio Adveniente. It had to do with how the world was going to prepare for the millennium and what it meant. Now, this event, of course, has already happened. <laughs> the year 2000 came and has gone. We're sitting at 2005, looking at 2006. How did that happen? <laughs> There are many among us who thought this world was not going to go beyond the year 2000. Do you remember that? Yes, isn't that amazing? Maybe that was a deception. <laughs> See? We're still here. We better be careful how we talk and how we say things. Jesus is coming and he's coming Soon, but we better stop putting years on things and dates. We don't know just when. And we mustn't be caught up with the excitement of people saying, Oh, oh, he's coming, he's coming before the year 2000. Well, <laughs> okay. Well, this particular document of November 10, 1994, was about the year 2000, and the people who were putting that out weren't thinking that Jesus was coming at all. That's not what they thought was coming. We'll see what they meant by that in just a moment. The second declaration was also pontifical. And it was to the Academy of Sciences on October 22nd, 1996. That's an interesting date, isn't it? <laughs> that was two years later. The, the uh, document was called Truth Cannot Contradict Truth. Interesting title. The document dealt with evolution. The third declaration in the series, Dis Domini. Okay. And this Domini was delivered on May 31st, 1998. So two years for each one. In that amazing document, which uh, was put, by the way, all three of them can be found online. The Vatican is not 
shy about any of this. <laughs> okay, you, you can make your own copies of this stuff right from the, the computer. That's how I got mine. <laughs> I happened to tune in to the Vatican and see what they were doing, and all these things were available. That particular document, Dies Domini, is an amazing lengthy document. It's about that thick. You pack them up. About the rationale for changing the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. Yeah. 1998. Now, if you just happen to tune into these documents one at a time, I just said, well, way back there in 94, well, that's no big deal. Well, what's that all about? And then in 96, you see another one, say, oh, that's nothing. And then 98, well, that's an interesting subject. If you saw them individually, they wouldn't mean anything. But when you see all three of them stacked up, you begin getting a picture. There's something being addressed in these three things. Something is happening when you see them together. And that's why we're doing this today. We want to see what happened. What does it mean? John Paul II has left his mark on this planet with those three documents. And we're going to see what's going on here. The fact that this one man did all three of those documents should also make us wonder what's going on here. You know, he's just one man, we say. But wait a minute, what kind of a one man is this? <laughs> he was the leader of a one billion member organization. One billion people. And when he speaks, or when he spoke, they're required to listen. <laughs> And so the question comes, is it possible for one billion people to be wrong? Well, if they're listening to this one man and he gets something wrong and they all believe that, <laughs> that means a billion people are wrong. <laughs> And they're all wrong in the same way. <laughs> now, I don't know what you think about that. But to me, to have a billion people believe what somebody else thinks and their brain isn't working anymore, they just believe because he says so. That's nightmare stuff. A billion people operating like that. So these three documents mean something. And we want to notice what these three documents are about. There are people in this world who study for themselves. And maybe once they get a hold of this, that this has happened, they would be serious in their consideration that something has gone on here that, that we need to know about, that the whole human race needs to know about, because this is going to affect everybody. We've got to find one place and one place only where we can, all of us as humans on this planet, be sure we can get together to believe as a source. Where would that be? Yeah, the Bible, the Word of God. Now, to us, that seems so basic. But you know, the leader of that organization is not behind that thought at all. That the Bible is the place you go. They have a thing they call tradition. And they believe that the same way as they do the Bible. Probably more. They have a magisterium, which is a living, present way of getting to truth for today directly from God. And of course, it has to go through them. <laughs> so in order for there to be a level playing field, we've got to put all of that aside so that fairness 
it can be available to everybody. The Bible and the Bible only. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to measure these three documents based on that only, the Word of God. Now, next week, we're going to do something a little different. Uh, not, not next week, but the week following. Next time we're together, we're going to bring in the spirit of prophecy. But for today, we're going to look at only the Bible and these three documents. Okay. Now, when these three documents came out, the year 2000 was still in the future. And the whole world's attention was on that year 2000 coming. <laughs> there wasn't anybody who was in civilization who wasn't concerned because there was something going on that they wondered, how's it going to come out on January 1? There's a thing called Y2K. <laughs> and no doubt you uh, were involved yourself wondering, well, well, what happens to the airplane that's flying and the computer flips over on... <laughs> and the, it comes up with the year 1900 instead of the year 2000. <laughs> everybody was involved. The Russians, the Chinese, everybody. <laughs> and so the year 2000 was a big deal to this world. So let's see what the Pope was doing with this first document, Tusho Millennio Adveniente. I'm going to read a few of his uh, comments. In paragraph 23, he said, Preparing for the year 2000 has become, as it were, a hermeneutical key of my pontificate. So to him, it was a big deal. That's what he was aiming for, to prepare something for the year 2000. And then he says, papal journeys have become an important element. Well, he's the most traveled pope there's ever been. He says that's part of it. That's why he was traveling, to get the world ready for a certain thought process in the year 2000. And then he said, showing concern, these, these travels were showing concern for the development of of ecumenical relationships with Christians of various denominations. So why was he traveling? Ecumenism. What is ecumenism? <laughs> yeah, bringing all the Christian churches together. Where? <laughs> yeah, to Rome. <laughs> okay. So, the mission of John Paul II was to bring the churches back to the Catholic Church. That is the Protestant churches, the Orthodox churches. But he didn't stop there. He was aimed at the Jews. He was aimed at the Muslims. Yeah, bring everybody. And he was aiming at the year 2000 for something to fall. Something to happen. He wanted to unite all Christians. In paragraph 36, he says this, though. Let's, let's listen to see if we can pick it up. Quote, Does it leave room for charisms, ministries, and different forms of participation by the people of God without adopting notions borrowed from democracy and sociology which do not reflect the Catholic vision of the church and the authentic spirit of Vatican II. Well, what did he say there? He said in this ecumenism and bringing in all these people, are we going to bring in democracy too? He said that's not according to Catholic theology. He just flat out said democracy is not part of the way we think. <laughs> it's not the way we do things. So the kind of ecumenism he was talking about is something at least Americans might have a little problem with. <laughs> the unity that he's envisioning brings everybody in. The Buddhists, the Hindus, the Muslims, the Jews, everybody. 
and he decided that it would be in two phases. That's what it says in this document. The awareness phase and the preparation phase. Now, this just isn't some philosophy he's throwing out. He's saying how we're going to do this. Those two phases. Phase uh, one, they were already in when he put out the document, but phase two began in 1997. And if you look at the documents carefully of the year 1997, that was the year of Jesus. That year was dedicated to Jesus, 1997. Remember, this is getting ready for the year 2000, the Jubilee. I don't think I said the word yet. Okay, the Jubilee. That's what the Catholics are aimed at. All right. The year 1998 was the year of the Father. Okay, so 97 was Jesus. 98 is the Father. 99 is the year of the Spirit. Now, I shouldn't get too far ahead here because we're aiming towards the year 2000, but we're the other side of it now, I can say it. The year 2000 was the year of Mary. <laughs> no, isn't that interesting? You get the Godhead to, to prepare it, but when you get there, it's Mary. Uh, in in uh, paragraph 44, the veneration of Mary, it says she will be, as it were, indirectly present in the whole preparatory process. That's in this document. I'm reading what he said. <laughs> okay. She would be part of the whole process. And this is the way the, the document ends. Uh, paragraph 59. I entrust this responsibility of the whole church to the maternal intercession of Mary, mother of the Redeemer, she, the mother of fairest love, will be for Christians on the way to the great jubilee of the third millennium, the star which safely guides their steps to the Lord. So nothing can happen without Mary. In paragraph 27, this little piece I almost missed, but it was sitting in there. It says this. We are reminded that it would be difficult not to recall that the Marian year took place only shortly before the events of 1989. What happened in 1989? The wall went down. So what he said was, indirectly, it was Mary who knocked down communists. <laughs> so the Pope, is doing evangelism. He's going to bring all the Christians. He doesn't call them Christians, by the way. He's going to bring all the, all the people out there into Christianity. Christianity is what he does. <laughs> and that's the way their literature reads, if you're reading carefully. They are Christianity. And the other people that they allow to be called Christians are only so because they say it's okay. In paragraph 55, it says the International Eucharistic Congress will take place in Rome on the occasion of the Great Jubilee, the year 2000 will be intensely Eucharistic. Well, what is Eucharist? It's the Mass. Yeah, the Eucharist, the host, all of that. It's Jesus actually turning into a piece of bread. And he just said two things here. that I don't know how Protestants can listen to this and not have something happen to them. Mary! Oh, they are saying something about it. In the Time magazine just a few weeks ago, this is the Protestants are now learning how to venerate Mary. Yeah, they say, oh, we've ignored her for too long. 
Yeah. Protestantism is going for it. The veneration of Mary. Of course, Mary. <laughs> is Mary. She was a holy woman. But she is not what the Catholic Church is saying. And of course, the second thing here is the Mass. The Mass is blasphemy. The Mass means... That a priest, a human, sinful being can call Jesus down from wherever he is and create him again anytime he wants. And turn him into that piece of bread. Of course, the words are interesting that the priest uses, hocus corpus man, sounds a lot like hocus pocus to me. <laughs> we won't get off on that side right now. We just want to notice. That these words we're reading are what the Pope put out way back then to start getting the preparation going. In great controversy, I'm going to give you one quote in the end. 588. Papists, Protestants, and worldlings will alike Accept the form of godliness without the power. And they will see in this union a, gr a grand movement for the conversion of the world. And the ushering in of the long expected millennium. What a sentence. She saw all this coming. The Lord revealed it to her. That the millennium would be a marker for getting the world together under one banner. Yeah. But let's notice the two things that are going to bring the world together. The first and I have the article at home, was under the news agency's banner called Genesis Denied. We're, let's spend some time with that first so we don't get confused here. That's the second declaration. The second declaration was called Truth Cannot Contradict Truth. And what he meant by that title was Science and the Bible agree. The Bible does not contradict science. Well, you say that to people on the street. If the Bible is truth and science is truth, yeah, there can't be any contradiction. <laughs> Sounds pretty good to me. Well, the problem with that is, although truth cannot contradict truth, that's not what's happening here. What's happening is an interpretation of the truth. And your interpretation and my interpretation might disagree. <laughs> so an interpretation of truth is not the truth. An interpretation is an interpretation. It's a story about the truth. <laughs> okay. Some people's stories can be different. <laughs> they can all tell different stories. So let's get rid of that title, first of all. Truth cannot contradict truth. It's, it's, a, it's a misleading kind of an idea. Genuine science, first of all, is verifiable. You can do it over and over and over, and it always does the same thing. You can see it. You can observe it. You can count on it. You can establish what men call law by it. That's real science. And there is a real science in this world. Okay? That science does see what God has done properly. But there is also a false science. A science that is not a science at all, but it's more speculation. It's more philosophy. It's, it uses things that really are not verifiable. On some occasions here, I've mentioned that mathematics is true science. But I should warn you 
There is now a mathematics that is not true science. And it came out of calculus. I will get into that right now. And it is based on the idea of zero. Do you know that there are mathematical equations that scientists use where they put a zero in it to make it work? They have different names for these things. And as they go through their formulas and they work it all out, the only way they can get to the answer is to take the zero out at the end. <laughs> it's a little trick. We'll talk about that maybe sometime here just to show where modern science today is using tools that have nothing to do with reality. All right. So anyhow, truth is absolute because God is absolute. And that's the only truth there is. Everything else is stories about the truth. All right. I want to quote from uh, Truth Cannot Contradict Truth Now. The Pope says this. Evolution is now more than a hypothesis. It's not a theory anymore. <laughs> and so if you're one, one of those one billion Catholics who believe what the Pope says, evolution is not a theory anymore. It's the truth. The Pope said so. <laughs> Well, I don't know if one billion people can figure out what just happened when the Pope does that. But this is what I get out of it. The Bible now has to agree with science. <laughs> what science says is the truth. And if the Bible disagrees, that's too bad. The, the science is right. Well, he said something else in paragraph four. He said that evolution is a meta-scientific elaboration. Yeah, I have to stay with his words. Meta-scientific elaboration. That means it's not science at all. It's philosophy. And that's the one thing he was really trained in, was to be a philosopher. He understood philosophy. Human philosophy, that is. Well, uh, let's try to figure out what kind he was talking about, because he was a highly sophisticated individual. He was educated. He knew the philosophical systems. Which one was he talking about? What was he saying? that he didn't really put down in a form you can get a hold of. He said enough, we can. There is a method that philosophers uh, have used since a man by the name of Hegel formulated it. I'm going to read you what the Pope said first, and then I'll get into Hegelianism just a little bit. In paragraph 6, he says, the method that is used to make everything work is this, that makes it possible to reconcile two points of view which would seem irreconcilable. That's his quote. Do you know what he just said here? Two opposites, which it seems impossible to reconcile. That's the method he's using, philosophically. Well, if you never heard about it, you wouldn't know what he's saying. But in philosophy, there is a system that is known as Hegelianism that says thesis, that's an idea, antithesis, an opposite idea, and the way you make those two opposites work is you synthesize them. That's the philosophy. I have white and I have black and now I make them the same. <laughs> well, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> but to a philosopher, that's what they do.
And that's exactly what the Pope just said here. You get two opposites that are irreconcilable and you use the method. That's the method. You bring them together in a synthesis. Somehow in, in the philosopher's mind, some higher reality works when you do that. <laughs> and they're no longer opposite. Well, we don't need to get involved in that. I mean, don't even try to understand it. It's not understandable. <laughs> it only works for philosophers. <laughs> but now, let's put it together, what he just did. Adam. The Bible. Evolution. Science. And now you bring them together. The Catholic Church is the place where Adam and evolution come together. I'm going to read you his words now on this subject. Paragraph 6. Paragraph 5 it starts. All right, here's the quote. It is by virtue of his spiritual soul that the whole person possesses such a dignity in his body. Pius XII stressed this essential point. If the human body takes its origin from pre-existent living matter, the spiritual soul is immediately created by God. End of quote. So, what has the Catholic Church done? They say, your body came through evolution. <laughs> but your soul came the minute you were born. God gave you a soul then. And that's how they make the Bible and evolution work. Hegelianism. Going further, this is how he says it works. While the formulation of a theory like that of evolution complies with the need for consistency with observed data, it borrows certain notions from natural philosophy. So he has brought science and philosophy together. And the word that comes to my mind is amalgamation. <laughs> Is done an amalgamation. Mankind is, is the product of evolution from the body and soul from God. Well, how do the Catholics make this work? According to Catholic theology, the soul has a separate existence. And it can be either in or out of the body. That's how they make it work. Unfortunately, at this point, if somebody's listening to this tape who doesn't like the sound of that, it's because most of the churches of today also believe that. And that's why they can be evolutionists in the Protestant churches. They're Roman Catholic in theology, actually. Genesis 2-7 is the first time this term soul is used in Scripture. And it provides an understanding that's foundational to every other instance of its use. I want to mention one little thing here because there are some people who think that Genesis 2-7 is not a good enough scripture to you. They think, well, that's Moses, that's Old Testament. And people have different reasons why they want to reject Genesis 2-7 as foundational. But I want to remind you that over there in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verse 45, Paul says, it is written. 
Now, the strange thing is that in most Bibles, they don't say where that quote comes from. But I think you will recognize it. He says, it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. <laughs> he is quoting Genesis 2, 7. And I have to tell you, if it's good enough for Paul, it's good enough for me. <laughs> I don't need commentaries to say something else. <laughs> no excuses. Paul quotes it as his authority to prove who Jesus is. That Jesus is the second man who has the power to make a living spirit. <laughs> well, let's look at Genesis 2-7 a little more carefully. It says, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now, it doesn't say he was given a soul like the Catholics teach. It says he became, and the, the Hebrew and the Greek over where Paul talks are very interesting. It has to do with the ability to perceive. In the modern versions, by the way, uh, I really uh, think that the King James is a good way to study because it leads you into a lot of places that you don't find in the modern version. But I think you should have at least one modern version around someplace so you can look at scriptures that you're not too sure about and find out what it says over there just in case. In the modern versions, it doesn't say living soul. It says living being. And you know that is a good translation. <laughs> he became a living being. Well, what would happen if he was no longer a living being. <laughs> He'd be a dead being. <laughs> I mean, anybody should be able to get that. <laughs> you say living soul, that's hard on people. They say, well, when you die, the soul goes someplace. Well, not if you say it's a dead soul. And they say, well, you can't say that. The Bible doesn't say it's a dead soul. Well, yes, it does. Over there in Ezekiel, that's exactly what he says. Ezekiel 18.4 says, A soul that sins, it shall die. I read that once in a meeting, and there happened to be a Baptist lady sitting in front of me. And after the meeting, she came to me. No, it wasn't after the meeting. It was right then and there. Yeah, she stopped the meeting. She raised her hand, and I said, Yes. She said, My pastor has never read that scripture to us. <laughs> The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And I just looked at her and I said, well, it's not likely you're ever going to hear him read that one. If death is really death, then there is no such thing as an immaterial spirit wandering around thinking and talking or doing whatever they think he's doing. In Psalm 146 in the New English Bible, 146 verse 4, it says, He breathes his last breath. He returns to the dust, and in the same hour all his thinking ends. That seems pretty clear to me. All of his thinking ends. There's no thinking going on in the grave. Psalm 115 verse 17, it says, The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. No talking. Ecclesiastes 9.5, and this one is so powerful, just about every church says it's not an inspired text, so be careful. Yeah. The living know. Ecclesiastes is. 9.5. The living know they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Well, you know, if that was the only scripture in the Bible that said that, and uh, somebody says, well, that's not inspired, I might have a problem. But I can show 15 other scriptures that say exactly the same thing, so it seems to me it is inspired. <laughs> yeah, when you find all the scriptures saying the same thing on that subject, 
Now you can find scriptures that are not talking about what happens when a person dies and twist them around a little bit. There are many scriptures you can do that with. But when you find scriptures that say specifically what the dead are doing and not doing, it's very clear. It's very clear. John says it this way. Oh, how did we get into the New Testament? John 3, 36. He who believes on the Son has everlasting life. And he that believes not. <laughs> will not see life. Immortality. Is not something that humans have. By themselves. They have to seek it. Romans the second chapter verse 27. To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. It's something we need to seek. We don't have a... Jesus called death a sleep. People, some people don't like that term sleep. But Jesus used it. Sleep is not a time of conscious activity. It's a period between two wakeful times. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, what did Lazarus have to say about that time when he was asleep? Why not? Why didn't he say anything? There's nothing to talk about. <laughs> Simple. You know, when Jesus said our friend Lazarus is asleep, the disciples said, oh, good, he's going to be all right then. So then Jesus had to say it plainly, no, Lazarus is dead. <laughs> He's dead, John eleven fourteen, And so while uh, it may come as a total surprise to many people in this world, it really is pivotal to understand the dead are really dead. So a soul is not something that a person is given. A soul is what a person is. <laughs> It's impossible, absolutely impossible to say you believe in the Bible and believe that Adam evolved and was given a soul. The Bible nowhere teaches such a thing. Now, for those people who are theologians and, and they're going to believe what, no matter what you tell them in the Bible anyhow, I want to ask a question. What about death? Where did it come from? According to my Bible, there was no death before Adam. <laughs> now, if Adam has been evolved physically through Dryopithecus and Australopithecus and all the Where was all that dying coming from? Who did it? Who started it? You can't use the Bible to get that kind of an answer. Paul says it, the wages of sin is death. And the first one we know that did that was Adam and Eve. We cannot amalgamate evolution and Genesis. It cannot be done. It's a strange thing that has happened in Christianity where so-called Protestant churches who claim to believe the Bible <laughs> want to somehow still believe in evolution also. And if we're going to say there was no Adam and Eve, which is where some people go, you're going to have to throw away the whole Bible. How can you believe in a Bible where the whole thing about sin and Jesus? You know, Paul said it was through one man that sin entered the world. Now, if you're going to throw out Paul, what are you going to do with all of his writings? Paul's entire concept of man is based on the fall of Adam. 
For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. So, in the cosmologies of this planet, only Genesis gives us a true account of the beginnings, where things really came from. And to exchange the Word of God for what the scientists call unknowables <laughs> is really the height of, I don't know what to call it, well, where is all this going? It's going to Dies Domini, the third one. Dies Domini. That's where the Pope was headed. It becomes the focal point in the year 2000, next in the papacy. And by the way, you know this new Pope Benedict? He says, my pontificate is about bringing the churches. Uh, he's following through, see? He's doing exactly what he's supposed to be doing. So, we want to focus our attention for a moment on why are these three documents in history now the way they've been lined up? Why are they sitting there waiting to have their results. Why three? They are a direct challenge to three angels. Yeah. A direct challenge. <laughs> I want to focus on that now. Revelation 14 is an amazing message from God. There are three angels there. The first angel is a call to worship the Creator. At this time of the world, that's what God says He wants His people to understand. They are to worship Him as the Creator and not be evolutionists. Well, this Domini talks about the Creator. And almost all of the churches talk about the Creator. But somehow they're not saying the same thing that Genesis is saying. That's what we want to notice. There's a shift that takes place in this Domini. The whole document is to take the seventh day and move it aside and take the first day as the day you worship now. And they say it's to honor God in honor of the resurrection. But the three angels come at the right time with a complete message saying there's something wrong with that. There is something really wrong. In the 12th verse of the 14th chapter, God points out who his true people are going to be in that time. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Well, the, the Ten Commandments, I thought everybody liked the Ten Commandments. I mean, we even had judges out there getting in trouble because they put the Ten Commandments up in there. Are we talking about the same Ten Commandments that God wrote with His own finger? <laughs> yeah, Exodus 31, 18, it says, He wrote them, not Moses. It's not the law of Moses, like people say. It's the law of God. He wrote it with His own finger. And in the middle of the Ten Commandments that He wrote, He said to worship on the seventh day. Does the papacy know this? I'm going to quote now from Dies Domini. Let's see what the papacy says. Quote, At the completion of God's work, the world is ready for human activity. On the seventh day, God finished His work which He had done, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work which He had done. It would be banal to interpret God's rest as a kind of divine inactivity. By its nature, the creative act which founds the world is unceasing and God is always at work. As Jesus himself declares in speaking of the Sabbath precept, my Father is working still and I am working, John 5:17. 
The divine rest of the seventh day does not allude to an inactive God, but emphasizes the fullness of what has been accomplished. That's paragraph 11. The God who rests on the seventh day, rejoicing in his creation, is the same God who reveals his glory in liberating his children from Pharaoh's oppression. Paragraph 12. Therefore, if God sanctifies the seventh day with a special blessing and makes it his day, did you hear that? His day, par excellence, this must be understood within the deep dynamic of the dialogue of the covenant, indeed, the dialogue of marriage. Paragraph 14, the Lord's day is the day of this relationship par excellence when men and women raise their song to God and become the voice of all creation. Did you notice the shift? He does not mean by the Lord's day, the seventh day. He's been saying seventh day, seventh day, seventh day, and then he says Lord's day. Well, wait a minute. I've heard that some of myself also. The commandment of the Decalogue by which God decrees the Sabbath observance is formulated in the book of Exodus in this distinctive way. Remember the Sabbath day in order to keep it holy. And the inspired text goes on to give the reason for this, recalling as it does the work of God. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. That's what the poem says. Which is based on what he's saying. I don't see how anyone can doubt that word seven. <laughs> Even the papacy knows that. Here's another quote. Very early on the first day after the Sabbath, Mark 16, 21. He quotes Mark 16. Sunday is the day after the Sabbath. Now, I think almost the entire Christian world believes that Jesus was resurrected on Sunday. I said it that way because I can think of another church, the Church of God, that says that Jesus was crucified on Wednesday and rose on Saturday. Well, that's another category entirely. They're such a minority, we don't need to deal with that. But the, the Christian world believes Jesus was resurrected on Sunday. That's biblical. He was resurrected on Sunday. That's it. What we call Sunday. The Bible doesn't call it. By the way, I want to mention that just briefly here. God never uses the word Sunday. Never. It's not found in the Bible one time. The word Sunday is a pagan title. The day that God calls the day Jesus rose is known as the first of the week. That's what it says. The first of the week. It doesn't even say day. The, the word day is not in the Greek. The first of the week. The first of the week. Because that's the way the Hebrews said it. The first of the week. What do you mean the first of the week? Well, there's a second of the week. And there's a third of the week. And a fourth of the week. And the fifth and the day of preparation. Well, the first until when? The first before the Sabbath. The second before the Sabbath. The Sabbath is the standard. See? The first of the week. Okay, so getting back to our thought here. Well, you're showing me something here. The first, yeah, the word day is not there. That's an added word. <laughs> All right, whenever you see an italicized word, remember, that word is not in the original language. That means the translators put it in, and they're telling you, we did that so you know. <laughs> okay? All right, now, the entire Christian world then knows that Jesus was resurrected on Sunday, the day they call Sunday. That's the day after the Bible Sabbath. And yet, the declaration is that the Sabbath has been changed to that first day of the week. Well, who did that? <laughs> it's answered in testimony. Yeah, he says it. I'm going to read to you. 
because the third, they call it the third commandment because they took out the second. <laughs> okay. Because the third commandment depends upon the remembrance of God's saving works and because Christians saw, Christians saw the de definitive time uh, inaugurated by Christ as a new beginning, they made the first day after the Sabbath a festive day. For that was the day on which the Lord rose from the dead. In paragraph 64, he says, this is why Christians called as they were to proclaim the liberation won by the blood of Christ felt that they had the authority to transfer the meaning of the Sabbath to the day of the resurrection. They. They. And that's through the document. They. Who's they? <laughs> Paragraph 18. We move from the Sabbath we, we move from the Sabbath to the first day after the Sabbath, from the seventh day to the first day, the Dis Domini becomes a Dis Christi. We celebrate Sunday because of the venerable resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we do so not only at Easter, but also at each turning of the week. So wrote Pope Innocent I at the beginning of the fifth century testifying to an already well-established practice which had evolved from the early years after the Lord's resurrection. Are you catching these words? We, they, is the Pope. He says, we did it. We Christians, we had the authority to do that. And did you notice how he said they did it? It evolved. Evolution is how we got Sunday. Sunday and evolution go together. <laughs> you know, it would seem to me that once a person becomes aware of some of this, there should be some sober questioning. Evolution has always been the antagonist of the Creator. If the Creator is going to change His law, it seems to me He ought to say something about it somewhere. And we ought to be able to see it. Let's see if it's there. Matthew 12, 8, Jesus said, The Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. Well, Jesus says that's His day. The Sabbath is the Lord's day. The seventh day. He made the day holy. It belongs to Him. Only Jesus has the right to change it. When he said that, imagine you're standing there that day and you heard him say that statement, that he was Lord even of the Sabbath. What day would any rational person think about? <laughs> there isn't a person in the world back then who didn't know the Sabbath was the seventh day. When Jesus spoke, he did not explain it, which day he meant. He was referring to the only scriptural Sabbath that had ever been in existence. The seventh day. There is no record anywhere in the Bible that Jesus ever said he was Lord of any other day. The Sabbath is the Lord's day, the only day sanctified by God. So, Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man. Mark 2, 27. Dish Domini says it's the Jewish Sabbath. And by the... I don't know if you have been out there talking to people, but uh, if you have, you should be recognizing every one of these arguments are the same ones the Protestant churches use. Exactly the same ones. They got them from the Catholic Church. The Sabbath was blessed by God in the Garden of Eden. You remember that? Who were the only people who had any advantage of that blessing? Who had any? 
So we just need to ask one more question. Were they Jews? <laughs> My Bible tells me the Jews came along after Abraham. <laughs> no, the Sabbath was made for man. That means from Adam to the last man that ever lives. In this Domini, paragraph 64, for several centuries, Christians observed Sunday simply as a day of worship without being able to give it the specific meaning of Sabbath rest. Only in the fourth century did the civil law of the Roman Empire recognize the weekly recurrence determining that the day of the sun, the judges, the people, of the cities of the various trade corporations would not work. He even quotes Constantine's edict. <laughs> well, you mean Emperor Constantine had the authority to change God's Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday? <laughs> I don't know why he even appeals to that. The Greek term Himera Kuriake, the Lord's Day, is only found one time in the whole Bible. That's in Revelation 1.10. It says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. It's the only scripture that says that. Now, does it say which day that is in that scripture? You can't tell what day it is from that scripture. There's no way. It just says there is a Lord's Day, but it doesn't say what day it is. So if you go to that day to prove the Lord's Day is Sunday, I don't know how in the world you can do it. Well, there must be another wonderful text someplace. It turns out 1 Corinthians 16, 2 is the big one. That's the one that proves it. Yeah. By the way, there are only two texts in the New Testament that any church can go to to prove Sunday is the Sabbath or it's been changed, and that's where they go. So let's look at both of them. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2. Upon the first of the week, let every one of you lay him in store as God has prospered him, that there may be no gatherings when I come. Well, there, that proved it. Sunday is the new Sabbath. <laughs> you know, I read this to several missionaries that came to my house because it's the one they used. They said, that proves it. I said, well, why don't we read it? <laughs> and they said, okay. So we read the scripture, and after we read the scripture, they looked up. <laughs> and I said, well, I guess we proved it. <laughs> and they just looked at each other. They could not believe the scripture didn't say anything about changing the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. What's this scripture say? Anyhow, what Paul is saying, you know, over there in Jerusalem, they're having a hard time and we need to help them out. Let's get some money together to help them and whatever else we can help them with. Uh, when I come, I don't want there to be a bunch of gatherings. You do it each working day, first working day of the week. You make your accounts, you set something aside, you have it set aside. And when I come, there's no gathering taken out. Simple. There's nothing here about changing the Sabbath. He's talking about a collection, not in church, but in their homes. Well, there went that powerful scripture. There's only one left. There's only one left. It's over there in Acts, the 20th chapter, verse 7. On the first day, Paul was preaching at midnight. Yeah. And the first thing that I asked my missionary friends, is that when you people go to church? Midnight on Sunday? They said, no. I said, well, how are you going to use this text to show what you're supposed to be doing for worship? Well, why is it even in the Bible that Paul was preaching at midnight? That's because he put a man to sleep with his preaching. <laughs> That's a great comfort to preachers. 
The young man fell out of the third story, and of course he killed himself. And Paul went over there, in the spirit, raised the man back to life. That's why it's in the Bible. It's the last time Paul ever saw those people. Well, you say, yeah, but it was on Sunday. Well, let's see. It says midnight. That's the way pagans keep time, is midnight to midnight. God doesn't do it that way. In Genesis, the first chapter, he begins by saying the, the evening and the morning were the first day. Where did God start? The dark part, evening. God starts at at the dark part and counts his 12 hours and then it's sunlight and then, and then now it's 12 hours and then it gets dark again. The evening and the morning was the second day. The evening and the morning was the third day. The evening and the morning was the fourth day. That's the way God counts time. Why do you suppose he did that with those people back then? They didn't have any watches. <laughs> yeah, they didn't have any clocks. On the fourth day, he said, you use the sun and the moon to measure time. And so you get the month out of that, and you get the year out of that. And you get every day when it ends. It's at sunset. See? You can worship God at sunset because you're still awake. Who's awake at midnight? See? That's the way the devil wants people to do things. You begin and end your day while you're asleep. That way you have nothing to do with God. That pagan Roman time. No, God, over there in Mark, the first chapter, says at, at sunset, you begin your new day there. All right, so what's happening in Acts 20, verse 7? Paul is preaching at midnight. Well, let's back up. When, did, when do you suppose he started preaching? At 10 o'clock? 9 o'clock? Well, the sun went down. And he must have been preaching before that. What day is it before the sun goes down? This is seventh day Sabbath. He was doing what he always did. He was preaching on Sabbath. The book of Acts is full of Paul preaching on Sabbath. And you know, people say, oh, well, that was just to the Jews. No, my Bible says the Gentiles said, you know, we want to hear what you're saying to them too. Preach to us. They said that to him on Sabbath. And you know what he said? Well, you come back next Sabbath. Why didn't he preach to him on Sunday the next day? Hmm? No, they had to come back next Sabbath, the seventh day. And he did that for 72 weeks in a row. Yeah, three and a half years, one place. and You, you, you start adding them up. <laughs> Paul was a Sabbath keeper. There's not one word about him keeping Sunday. He was preaching that particular Sunday at midnight because he wasn't going to be there anymore. He just kept preaching until <laughs> he left the next morning. Okay. In Deuteronomy 5.15, here's where the Pope becomes clever. He says uh, that in over there you don't keep the Sabbath because of creation. It's because you've been delivered. So deliverance is a reason to worship. Well, of course it is. But then he says that day is Sunday. Well, wait a minute. Now he made a shift. <laughs> no, there's not one word in the Bible that says that. Acts 13:42. When the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. That's what we just talked about. That's where the Bible says it. Acts 18.11, it says that he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath. He persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. The Pope now says the first day of the week began to shape the rhythm of the life of Christ's disciples. Now he's going into rhythms. He, he cites the, the road to Emmaus. Well, I want to know how walking on the road to Emmaus changes the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. And a, a scripture that is quoted by many ministers in all the churches, John 20, 19. 
Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for the fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace unto you. And they said, See, they were having a worship service on Sunday night. Oh, how in the world do they miss those words for fear of the Jews? They were hiding behind closed doors because they thought they were next. They were not in there worshiping Jesus and his resurrection. They didn't even know he'd been risen yet. How could that have been a worship service? But you're going to hear it. Here's the Pope using it. The next appearance was the next Sunday, they say, because Thomas was there. And you know the story that Jesus allowed him to touch him. By the way, that was not a disembodied spirit. That was a real body. Thomas touched it. <laughs> In Mark 132, oh, I didn't give you a scripture. I should give you that. Uh, at even when the sun did set. At even, that's when, when the new day began. All right, I need to finish quickly here. Angel 1 brings to the earth the everlasting gospel, which says, Worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. The gospel that saved Adam was, is the same one that saves mankind today. There are not two different gospels. Nothing can be added. Nothing can be changed in the merits of Jesus. The gospel of Adam included the Sabbath. It was a sign of his relationship to the maker and the and uh, evolution of course wipes out worshiping god as the creator angel one is directed against false science and false religion but what's the real issue here that you don't see right away it's the law of god if you can change the sabbath from saturday to sunday you have changed the law of God. And who can do that? Well, the Roman Catholic Church says they can. And the Protestants get away with it a different way. They just say it's been taken away. <laughs> and the ones who want to pretend like they're keeping the law say, well, the, the Sabbath has changed. Well, how can you change the Sabbath? Some say, well, it was just a symbol anyhow. Just a symbol. But it doesn't matter how you say it. If you're going to get rid of God's law, that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to get away from keeping the seventh day Sabbath. People ought to be honest and look at that. In Daniel 7.25, we should have, none of us, been taken by surprise. Daniel 7.25 says, This little horn, this power that's going to speak against God, that will blaspheme God, that will be more stout than his fellows, that will wipe out three kings, this religious political power is going to think he can change times and laws. Well, there's only one law I know that needs changing as far as the world's concerned. That's the Ten Commandments. They don't like it. And the only thing in the Ten Commandments that deals with time is the seventh day, Sabbath. And it says the Roman Catholic Church, the little horn, will think he can change it. And God says, that's fornication. That's another symbol, by the way. <laughs> That's fornication. Mixing up truth and error. The wine of Babylon is the way he says it in Revelation. In James, we read this. James 2.10 through 11. Whosoever shall keep the whole law. That judge that nailed the law up on the, the court there. Yeah. 
thinking he was honoring God. It says, Whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, Do not commit adultery, well, I think we can figure out which commandments those are, said also, Do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. Well, the fourth commandment is one of those. The statements are clear. The year 2000 was claimed by the Roman Catholic Church to be the launching time for the conversion of the world to the Catholic Church and her policies. Two thrusts. Natural immortality and the false Sabbath. Do we have them or don't we? Sunday makes a bond with Rome. All the Protestant churches that keep Sunday are going to go with Rome. They don't think so, but they're going to. They have the same holy day. Evolution leads to spiritualism. All the spiritualists are going to be involved in that. The three angels' messages were written for our time. In the last 10 to 12 years, all this has happened. It's here now. We can see it. We can look at it. We can analyze it. We can study it. It's here. We're not looking into the future. It's already happened. It's, it's now making its work come out. They are dealing with a concept that the United States has fallen into. Might makes right. We have the bombs. We have those smart bombs. We're going to get you. And it's no longer turn the other cheek. It's you get them before they get you. There's still time to learn about the Reformation. The real heroes, they died for the Word of God. The three angels are sounding again. We have been commissioned to warn the world. Our time is up, so I'll have to wait until next time to, to include some of the closing thoughts here. But uh, we can see that Pope John Paul II did his work, and he did it well. The foundation has been laid. It's now for this new pope to pick it up, and he seems to understand. Let's not drop the ball ourselves. Let's study and see what our part is on this, in this, on the God, Lord's side. Father, we thank you for your great love towards us. We don't begin to realize the privilege we have that you've called us for this time to warn a world that has no idea how it's been set up. Lord, help us to realize we just can't give them words or information. There's got to be a life with it. Help us to sense that only Jesus in us is going to be able to break through. There are people who not only don't want to know this, they're ready to be antagonistic toward it. Help us, Lord, to understand what Jesus meant, that we are to be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. Bless us, Lord, as we continue to learn and to follow your lead. In Jesus' precious name.